Uh, our speaker today is Michael Oru, who is a senior security consultant at TrustWave Spider Labs. He also is a, a lead core developer for the Beef Project. So please welcome me in giving Michael a warm welcome. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, unfortunately, um, Ty Miller cannot be here, as you can see. Uh, he's from uh, uh, Australia. He helped me. He actually developed the shell code, the custom shell code that uh, we are gonna, I'm gonna show you uh, later on in the talk. Um, so, yeah, yeah, he also works in pure hacking. Anyway, uh, we can skip this. <laughs> uh, okay, about the talk. Uh, we will discuss as a little bit about the current situation and traditional browser exploitation vectors. And uh, we will have a small introduction about Beef. How many of you know about the project already? All right, so we can skip that as well. And uh, we will see basically how we can compromise internal network services uh, from the hooked browser, uh, sending a custom shellcode that we developed. And then, um, well, and then a live demo at the end, it will be fun. So don't get bored. So current situation, uh, as you probably know, Grak, good friend, and you also know that, know that usually uh, browser exploits uh, are so is difficult to buy, and if you don't have a lot of money, you don't buy a good exploit. Uh, obviously, we are speaking about zero days. And also, um, some boxes, uh, for example, if you see uh, how many exploits were chained uh, in one of the latest Chrome uh, zero days uh, by a Russian guy, Sergei, I think, uh, he was using like, uh, mul like more than five or six exploits to actually like, uh, compromise the, multi mul the multiple layers of Chrome because we have different sandboxes for JavaScript, for uh, uh, external plugins, uh, and uh, you need to arrive at the end to exploit the, the Chrome um, component itself. It's called Chrome, and the browser is called Chrome. It's funny. Um, so obviously, if you are not like the US government, you are not going to buy zero days. And uh, or, well, US government, because we are in US, but every, you know, every government. Um, also, what happens if uh, the victim's browsers are, are patched a lot of times. Or, for example, if the victim use, uh, uh, for example, no script, uh, sometimes no script can also prevent uh, this kind of attacks because usually the delivery of uh, the, the exploit code is uh, mainly JavaScript that is probably coming from a different domain. And, or, for example, a malicious applet or a malicious flash or a malicious, malicious PDF. Um, also, how reliable are these exploits? Uh, depending if they are weaponized or not, and depending how much uh, did they cost, they, they could be less or more reliable. Um, and a lot of times, especially nowadays, uh, you, you have seen how many ways to compromise, the, to compromise the machine through Java applets. And for example, if you use Chrome, latest version, uh, also unsigned applet, applets that usually runs without uh, requiring uh, user intervention in the other browser. In Chrome, you still need to explicitly allow to run an unsigned applet. So basically, if you're not a moron, you, do not, you don't get phoned. That's more or less the philosophy. So cross-site scripting. Um, how many of you think that cross-site scripting is lame? <laughs> Probably many of you, uh, don't be shy. Uh, anyway. It's really misunderstood. Uh, it's actually found in 90% of, uh, of our application pen test. It's like the second or the third most critical find, finding we, we, we actually have. And usually, I mean, when, um, when, when you need to deliver the report to the client and saying, uh, OK, can I have a, this is the proof of concept. So you will see if you click on this link, uh, if you submit this request through BARP, you will see a nice pop-up. And, and the customer could say, what? What the fuck? I mean, is it this supposed to hurt me? No. All right. So uh, 
I joined Trustwave in March and in, uh, actually in, I, I'm working in London and usually when uh, I deliver this kind of application pen test and I found XSS, so like 95% of the times, uh, I usually deliver, um, I usually give to the customer uh, a beef uh, uh, demo recorded like, uh, like, uh, like, like a screen, uh, screen cast, mm. screen cast, screen recording. Uh, and usually they, they really understand the impact because you, you show, for example, uh, how you can key log uh, um, keystrokes, keystroke logging with JavaScript uh, or interfacing with Metasploit or doing social engineering attacks and a lot of other nice, nice, nice things that are not obviously only an alert box. Um, or for example, the, the, another lame thing like, okay, let's, let, let, this request will steal the cookie and we'll send it to my domain where there is a web server that is parsing the cookie that, which is arriving from a parameter. I mean, a lot of times, for example, this is not even possible because you cannot read cookies from JavaScript. So anyway. Uh, obviously, well, yes, this is a co cool slide. Internal server vulnerabilities are sitting there, bored and lonely. Um, so the idea is the, is the following. Uh, on the left, you can see Mr. Wade Alcorn, which is the original creator of Beef, still involved, very cool guy. He's actually a very cool guy because he's smart and he's also driving us always with new kind of different research. So in 2007, uh, he was researching something called interprotocol exploitation, which we will see in the next slide. And, and he said, okay, now it's 2012, let's see if we can research further and you know, do something cool, improve the research. Um, and then Ty Miller uh, said, okay, I developed a new staging shellcode that acts like a web server. Cool. And then I said, okay, let's put everything together, let's do some research and let's port everything to beef because the, in theory the attack should work like on the paper. And in fact, at the end it worked quite well. So uh, before going on the EPEC and the shellcode, uh, let me introduce a bit beef. So, well, you said that you already know what beef is, right? So um, anyway, uh, the point is that with beef, you can really finally uh, do post exploitation for XSS or whatever kind of vulnerability where you can actually inject uh, JavaScript. So even HTTP response splitting, for example, uh, or um, even a phishing page. So if you can control a page, uh, as we will see later, we will use a phishing page in our demo. So if you can say, victim, please go to this uh, link, which, is, which could be an XSS or not, um, then from the moment that the victim is Browse, the victim browser is rendering the JavaScript that you are sending or you are embedding in a page or in a link. From that moment, uh, an asynchronous communication channel is, is created between the victim browser and our uh, web application, so Beef. And then obviously, as if you, was in, uh, if you were in the in Ryan Barnett talk this morning, uh, Mod Security and Beef, he showed a lot of uh, modules that we currently have. Uh, we will see also some, something more later in, uh, in the live demo. Anyway, we have a lot of categories of uh, modules that can help you like, for example, uh, if the browser is Chrome delivering some particular, a particular Chrome extension and then hook the particular Chrome extension that runs in a different sandbox. And so obviously you can do much more from, 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 the, from the Chrome extension itself. Or, for example, integration with Metasploit uh, and other cool attacks on the network that we will use later. There are also a lot of features like uh, man in the browser, uh, tunneling proxy. For example, the tunneling proxy is a pretty nice thing. Uh, it was originally researched by Ferruma Vituna, and he created the POC. Uh, the point is that the POC was created, like the server side code was created, was written in ASP, so you had to run uh, uh, on bloody Microsoft uh, software, all right, like IIS, why I need to install IIS. So I said, okay, let's port it to Ruby. Ruby, the interpreter is obviously cross-platform, cross uh, runs on OS, OS X, Linux, and Windows, and BSD without any problem. So at the end, we, had, we, we ported also the tunneling proxy. So the idea of the tunneling proxy is actually that you use an XSS as a proxy, like you, you, you ask to the victim to do some request on the domain where the victim is hooked. 
and uh, send the response of this request back to you. So you basically open a server-side socket in Ruby, you point your browser to this server-side socket, and then uh, uh, the request that is arriving to this socket is translated in an Ajax request, which is injected in the victim page, in the victim um, session, and basically she is doing the request for you um, in the authenticated session that she's currently on. So basically, you don't need to steal cookies, for example. Uh, I did also other old presentation about this if you want to know more. So revitalizing inter-protocol exploitation. So why it's called inter-protocol exploitation? Because the idea that Wade had is the following. There are some protocols like IMAP, uh, SMTP, IRC, SIP, which are, let's say, tolerant to errors. So if you send garbage to the protocol, to like if you send a packet with uh, ABC123, the connection is not closed. So this means that the socket is still open. And this also means that in theory, if we send, for example, let's say a post request, the uh, post request headers will be considered like bad comments, but the connection is still open. So basically, after you have the post request uh, headers, you, all, you will also have like the body of this post request, which will be text plain and will contain uh, valid command like login pass, for example, in IMAP. And then you can also append there your shellcode. And that will be actually interpreted, parsed, and in this way you can really pawn the service, as we will see later. So yeah, the, the whole idea is basically this, that the protocol is not resetting the connection um, if you send some garbage. For example, POP, the pop, uh, POP is doing that, and other protocols as well. So it's not that everything is vulnerable. Depending on the implementation, uh, you, sh you should check like with Wireshark and uh, debugger. Uh, before showing how the technique works, I would like to explain a bit about the limitation we had. Well, I had this part was mine. So there are multiple limitations. Um, the first one is obviously that you are, in, in beef, we, we are not doing any kind of magic to bypass the same origin policy. Obviously, if you, have, if you have a bypass and you want to include it in beef, it's fine. So I like, for example, if you want, like Java, with, with Java applets, for example, uh, uh, sometimes you can do that, like uh, depending on the version. No, this, this is, I think, is still not patched. So, for example, if you have, uh, let's say, two domains, uh, that are mapped to the same, uh, like two virtual hosts that are mapped to the same IP. In that case, if you do two requests from a Java applet, uh, the same origin policy will, will, will not be bypassed, but the point is that you can still send requests to those two domains, and you cannot do that, for example, in normal browser. You can do that in the Java applet because there is like a flow in how they implemented the same origin policy. But anyway, we are not doing any magic, so the point is that when you, the, the same origin policy, policy basically says, okay, um, you cannot, you, you can send data usually, but you cannot read the response if you are doing it cross domain. But still, the fact that you, you can send the data in Firefox and, Web, and WebKit, you can still do that, so Chrome and Safari. And this is usually enough to pawn services because you just need to send something and then this something, it will be basically the shell code will do actually something else later. And we, it will also enable normal cross-domain communication, as we will see in a second. Then port banning, another uh, security feature that every browser is implementing right now, uh, from a few years, actually, um, is port banning. So port banning means that you cannot send HTTP requests to known ports, like port 22, port 143. You get an error like this one, NS port access not allowed in Firefox. So, and that's bad for us, and that's good for security. The point is that on Firefox, if you install an extension, uh, the, basically the Firefox extension can override everything. And that's quite bad, because there is not some boxing. Uh, some things like the port banning feature shouldn't be uh, over, over, overwritable because this is actually enab enab enabling the attack. If this was not uh, possible, uh, the attack was basically not possible. 
Uh, in fact, this, the, the, the whole uh, proof of concept, which actually now is not a proof of concept anymore, is working fine, is working right now only in Firefox. Because in Chrome and WebKit, I still need to find a way to disable the port banding. Um, then another limitation uh, actually are, is the HTTP header size. So when you send the shell, when you send this cross-domain post request, as, you, as we, will, we will see later, uh, in the memory of the process that is receiving and parsing uh, this data, obviously the headers will be there as well. So when you write an exploit, you usually have a defined size, a specific size of, I don't know, 700 bytes, 800 bytes, where you can put your junk, your shell code, and whatever. Uh, in this case, you also need to consider the headers that will be there like junk, uh, but will be there. So usually every browser is creating like 400 bytes of headers. And this is obviously a big trouble, uh, a big problem, because if you are playing with shellcode that is bigger than 300 and something bytes, depending on the exploit you are currently working on, uh, it could be a, a, pro a problem because you cannot, you, you don't have enough, enough space. So it, mm, what, if you see the code online, which is already online because this presentation was actually presented first in Ruxcon uh, in Australia last week, um, there are a few headers uh, that you can uh, override with the XML HTTP request in the XML HTTP request object, as you can see there. Obviously, you cannot override everything like content length because then you can, for example, do HTTP. Uh, uh, you can do like uh, headers injection, for example. Um, another good thing that well, is helping us to save uh, some some size uh, is actually overwriting the. Um, uh, the user agent from the Firefox extension because you can do also that. Um, then another difference between the original uh, research from Wade and this new uh, technique is that actually we are sending uh, the cross-domain post request with content type text plane. This uh, is quite cool because it, it say basically we, we, we can have more space for our shellcode. And, and also we don't need to determine all those bloody boundaries that you need to have in a multi-part form data request. Um, and then obviously after exploitation, you are not back to normal out of browser shells. So meaning that uh, as you can use our shell code, you don't have to drop like a reverse meta-interpreter connection. So the shell code, uh, is actually, so as I said, is a staging shellcode. So we have the stager and the stage. The stager is like 299 two bytes, 299 bytes. It's actually a bit more after you encode some bad characters like the null byte, uh, uh, carriage return line feed, uh, depending on the exploit you are, obviously. And the stage is actually a bit more, but it's fine because actually the stage is uh, injected in memory and the one that needs to be small is actually the stager. And this is, this is actually a good size, reasonable size, especially because for what, is doing, for what the shellcode is doing that is quite complex, uh, the size is, is quite nice. So what is happening is that the stager, when you send like a cross-domain post request to, for example, port 143 on a machine in the internal network of the victim, uh, the stager is actually set, setting up, uh, binding a port that you, in, that you can choose in advance. And, uh, and then is ready to accept on that port another, an additional HTTP post request that will be sent a second later to deliver the stage. All right, and the stage, after the stage is delivered, again, port 4444 or the port you like uh, is uh, binded again. Uh, and from that moment, the shellcode will actually pipe commands to the operating system uh, and redire redirecting the output of the command, the, the, the command result back in a HTTP response. Now, the good thing is that after, so what we do cross domain and blindly is actually the, the, um, the stager and the stage delivery. From that, from the moment the, st the stage is running, uh, the shellcode is always replying with access control allow origin wildcard in an header in the HTTP response. And this allows us to 
Uh, so it's basically cores, right? Cross originators of sharing. And this allows us to read the response from the, those, those commands, obviously, because we need to read the command results. So from that moment, you have basically like a, a normal bind shell without authentication right now that is just waiting that you send other post request with, with the particular parameter command, cmd equal, for example, netstat, and then the shell code is returning back the result. Uh, we, also, uh, we also wrote a um, metasploit module that is not called webbind, but uh, it's actually uh, beefbind. This is not committed yet, but the code is ready, so I guess we, I will do a pull request on metasploit soon. Instead, all the code is already committed in our uh, GitHub repository. So this is how it looks uh, like uh, in Firefox. So the first one, this one is the stage. So as you can see, for example, we are sending a cross-domain post request on port 143 after port banding has been disabled. And the body of the request is actually containing some valid con commands like A001 list. And then uh, in this case, uh, the string for the egg hunter because I had to, uh, to write an egg hunter, uh, I, I, I had to use the egg hunter technique uh, for the exploit. And then the second one, as, as soon as this request is uh, received and uh, the shell code is running, we send the second request, still cross-domain, on the port that we can choose for 444 with the shell code again. And uh, yeah, basically that's how, that's what, what, what's happening. And in even if uh, for WebKit now the whole concept is not working because I, 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 I need to find a way to, to disable port binding. In fact, if you are sending, if you are trying, if, for example, if you bind the NIMAP service on uh, on a port that is not banned by the port banning method. This is working anyway in Chrome and Safari. And this is, this is the, the piece of code that we need to uh, like do a prototype of a writing on the XMHTP request object to create, to like create a send as binary me me method because it's not uh, uh, a normal method that is implemented in every browser. Firefox is implementing it natively and you can do that basically in uh, Chrome and WebKit. Um, another big limitation took me a while to figure out how to achieve reliable exploitation. Uh, it was actually the, 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 the fact that as you are doing everything from the victim browser, you don't know in advance the size of the headers. You cannot query, you cannot say, hey, XML HTTP request object, can you please let me know how many bytes the whole headers will be? So as you cannot, mo as you cannot know that in advance, what I did is the following. I open, I bind another port, another socket on beef, on a, on a different port from the one where the hook is uh, served from, in a way that the cross-domain uh, cross um, situation is maintained. So basically, before sending uh, uh, the original, uh, the, 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 the actual shell code to the target, I send back the same request without the shell code with just like 120 bytes in the, in the, in the, in the body. Uh, I send it back to, my, to, to myself in beef. In this way, I can, I can know exactly uh, how many bytes the HTTP headers will be. What I need to do after that is just saying to the JavaScript that is running on the victim browser, all right, the, the, the size was, for example, 427 bytes. Obviously, just do a, just double check, because the host will be different, obviously. Just double check a, a, a few other fields, but then at the end you can have uh, a reliable way to determine how many bytes the HTTP request headers will be. This is quite cool. Uh, well, as you know, I mean, when you write exploits, uh, one byte error is enough to have the shell code not working or the attack not working, obviously. So this was a necessary thing. Um, so if, for example, uh, a typical uh, structured exception handler uh, exploit with an egg hunter in a non uh, inter protocol exploitation situation is like that. So like if you see like what you are sending on the socket, so 
some command, then some, some junk shellcode, then the pointers to next CSA, and then at the end the egg hunter. That usually is like 32 bytes uh, with Kappa technique. And um, they, in, instead, with, in this situation, with interprotocol exploitation, you have uh, a slightly different uh, case. So you have the HTTP headers first, and you cannot get rid of it, unfortunately. And then you have less junk, obviously, because you, you actually create dynamically the junk in advance after knowing how, ma how many bytes you have for the HTTP headers, obviously. So this will be less than this one. Uh, this is how it looks in, uh, in memory. So uh, if you attach a debugger to, for example, the EMAP service, the exploit was a known exploit. Uh, we had, uh, I was targeting EMAP, Eudora, 6, something like that. There is a public exploit online. I just had to modify it with an egg hunter. And uh, basically, as you can see here, you can see post. So this is the, the memory of that process. So you can see that the headers are, are inside the memory. Post. And on the right, you, you can also see here that the, um, the, some valid commands are uh, in memory, then some uh, knob sleds are there as well. And finally, there will be the, the shellcode. And this is basically the same thing, but with a view from Wireshark. So this is the first reply. We just send uh, a bogus request to have a small reply from the server. Uh, from the target, and then this is actually what is sent. So all the headers and commands, uh, knob sleds, and then shellcode. And this is instead is how, uh, if, if, you, if you sniff the traffic, it's basically how you communicate with the shellcode. So you send another post request with command equal uh, the command you want to, to, to send, and then the shellcode is piping, uh, uh, doing, doing like creating some pipes, and then basically sending the command to the operating system, getting the results, and the response will actually be a response with the access control allow origin uh, wildcard header, so we can read the response, and with the, basically with the result. At the end, I also developed a small, uh, a small uh, like terminal in JavaScript using a library, and so basically you can, you can define the target in beef, and then you, as soon as the shellcode is, de is deployed, you can uh, uh, execute like commands from here. So this is like how, how it is, uh, uh, like the flow of the whole attack. So first of all, you need to trick the user to install a Firefox extension to disable port banning. Otherwise, uh, all those ports that you cannot target uh, are obviously not target. You cannot target them. Then. Um, you basically do JavaScript port scanning. Uh, well, you do like, uh, you, you can run the, net, the, the ping sweep module that we have in Beef, which can identify uh, which hosts are alive in the same subnet of the hooked browser. And then you can run uh, on those alive hosts, you can actually run the port scanning module, everything from JavaScript. And you can determine that, for example, port 143 is open. Then you blindly send the stager, obviously, blindly, unfortunately, because we are, again, in the same origin policy limitation. For example, mm, this whole attack, in case, for, we, for example, we don't have to proceed blindly, only if we find a way, obviously, to bypass the same origin policy. Or, for example, if this attack, as soon as will uh, work in Chrome, you can actually deliver a, a Chrome extension, a malicious Chrome extension that is allowing cross-domain communication, so you can even fingerprint the service in advance and send uh, the exploit only for the proper service. I will do that for sure soon. Uh, so basically, yeah, you send the stage. After you send the stager, then the port 444 is listening. And now the point is that then you send commands. The commands are, uh, the command results are retrieved. But the point is that you don't have any more, for example, like a reverse connection back to your servers but everything is going through uh, the victim browser. That's the point. So even from a forensic point of view, well, I mean, they will see something bad that is happening from the victim browser itself, right, in inside the internal network. Then you can have obfuscated JavaScript, you can have your server in China, 
whatever, if you are not doing it for work, obviously. And uh, I don't recommend that anyway. Okay, let's see the demo. So in this way, in this case, we are simulating uh, um, a production environment, right? Where we, we created a phishing domain called bing.com instead of bing. And uh, we start beef. Also, web sockets are enabled uh, by default, so the communication will be quite, quite nice, quite fast. So, what happened here is that we are using the RESTful API because you can programmatically control beef uh, with the RESTful API from a few months, and we are saying to the RESTful API to actually mount uh, a phishing page on the root URL of beef. And we already cloned it. We already cloned Bing.com. So now it's going to be mounted. All right. And uh, obviously, we can also access the, the beef panel on the same domain. And the Firefox browser is the victim, which is going to our phishing domain, which looks exactly the same. Obviously, the, obviously in the meantime, uh, the, clone, the clone page has also the beef hook embedded on it. So just to double check if uh, the victim is properly hooked, we send just a simple prompt dialog. All right, so yeah, we can, uh, yeah, we can now proceed to do interesting stuff. So first thing we want to deliver the Firefox extension using a fake flash update it was developed by Mike uh, Howard, a guy from Australia, a very cool module. So we are just gonna send, uh, uh, so when the victim will see the fake, the, like the, uh, she needs to update the, f the, the, the flash uh, uh, plugin, uh, when she will click anywhere in the page, um, a Firefox extension will be delivered. Obviously she needs to allow the execution of that Firefox extension, but still, I mean, Every, such a, every attack that involves social engineering is basically that. So we select the Firefox station. Yeah, and this is what the victim see, right? And install, sure. Then she will click allow. This is coming from the from our uh, from our B server. Then as soon as she will restart the browser, you will see here another uh, hooked browser after we refresh. That's because the Firefox extension is actually over, overriding the user agent. And so we see it as a different, as a different uh, uh, browser. We can, yeah. Yeah, well, this is still to, to check. Yeah, so this is in fact, the prefjs file of the file of the malicious Firefox extension. So the first thing is that we can override port banding with this directive, network security port banded override. Then we are also overriding the home page and the new tab URL to our phishing domain. So in case the victim is uh, went away from a tab, uh, as soon as she opens another tab, she will be in that same uh, phishing domain. So hooked again. And then uh, we are, gonna, we are also overwriting the user agent and we are also enabling Java. In case, like in the worst case, uh, you can probably send the malicious applet. <coughs> All right, so now we are gonna detect, uh, we are gonna check uh, which hosts in, uh, of the, in which hosts are alive in the victim uh, uh, subnet. We are just doing like, uh, we are just checking like 10 IPs. It usually takes like two seconds per IP, all right? So this is a demo, that's why I'm limiting the, the search for uh, 10 IPs, so 130 to 140. And there is in fact one host which is alive. 
And we are going to do a port scan only for port 143 on that host. That is the, the port that we, we, we want to send the shellcode to, the exploit to. And yes, port 143 is open. So this is the virtual machine with Windows XP Service Pack 3 and uh, our vulnerable uh, service up and running. The only reason I'm not doing a live demo is because actually the version of the IMAP service that I'm running there, Eudora, expired and I, was, I didn't have time to remove some stuff from the registry, honestly. It was like a 30 days demo, full working uh, edition anyway. So yeah, there is in fact one for three listening, and that's the, the machine. So now that we identify that the host is alive, that the port is open, and we are ready, we, are, we also injected the Firefox extension, so port banning is finally disabled. We are gonna, we are gonna send the beef bind module. So there are a few parameters here, you can usually leave them uh, as they are, except the host, the port, and uh, you can also play with the delays in case, for example, the client is very slow. You can add some delays over here because there are multiple steps if you look at the source code of that module. And then, um, yeah. So we are also, in this case, uh, again, for same origin policy limitation, we are not running beef on an IP, but on a domain, and, this, and for the same origin policy, they don't match, even if the domain is pointing to the IP, right? So other, if you don't do that, if you run beef on your, uh, on your uh, spare phishing uh, servers, uh, you need to, to do that. Otherwise, you will get some errors. So now, uh, this is what uh, is printed to the console in the, of the victim. It's just for just just as a demo, but obviously you get the same information back to beef as we will see in the module result. So this, the stager is sent back, and now basically the the code is double checking, uh, uh, like calculating the the size, uh, the exact size of of the headers, and then ac uh, adjusting the junk accordingly. As you can see here, you can, you can verify that everything is working properly. At the end, the stage is deployed. And you can use also this module, beef bind shell, to send single modules. And uh, as you can see here, we have a new port listening, 4444, which is, uh, which is actually our stage up and running. And instead of using the other module, we, you can just use the interactive shell. So you just define the target, so the machine where the stage is running. And obviously with the port, because you can, you can change it as you want. And as, as you can see, you execute commands, and then you get the response for those commands. And yeah, everything is working fine. So we did everything from the victim browser, from JavaScript, and without touching uh, at all the file system of the victim server. And yeah, then you can ex execute other commands, obviously, like uh, moving to C and do a dir inside that. And the last one to demonstrate that is not uh, a fake, but again, the code is online, you can try it by yourself. I'm just gonna create an empty file. In fact, copy is not working in this way, it's actually expecting a file, but my knowledge of Windows is not uh, the same as Unix. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and then exec dir, get the result of that. The new file is here. And, and yes, it is here as well. So,
And that was it, basically. So, well, you can ignore this last statement because yesterday I was very drunk. And you can see that. Uh, <laughs> you can feel it probably now. And thanks to my colleagues in Trasper. And uh, well, any questions? Anything? All right. Thank you for uh, being here. <laughs>